<laughs> oh, I've been looking forward to this one. Laying all my cards on the table right at the start of the game, I hate Jurassic World. I have hated Jurassic World since the first Jurassic World was released way back in the before times, the long, long ago, in the depths of our mystic past, the year 2015 when all the world was formed of one supercontinent called Pangaea and Star Wars was still a living, breathing franchise. I had a review listed on IMDb that year explaining some of the many ways I hated Jurassic World. It wasn't that it offended some nostalgic memory I had of the original Jurassic Park, or, well, not just that, it certainly did. That film occupies a very special place in my heart, it being the first film I actually remember watching. That being said, I am not one of those who rejects any hint of difference or development. I think The Lost World was a... well, it was it was an unremarkable attempt at a sequel, at least until it decided to bring a T-Rex to San Diego, where it staged a mostly peaceful protest against exploitative bioethics, and turned that film from unremarkable to remarkably bad. No, what I hated about Jurassic World was the way it looked at everything that made the original Jurassic Park good, and decided to take a massive triceratops-sized shit all over it. What makes the original brilliant is not just its concept and its ideas. Michael Crichton was a brilliant concept writer, and there have been few better able to take cutting-edge technical science, apply questions of ethics and morality, and place it in a captivating story such that bioethicists and popcorn munchers alike could be engrossed by the result. No, what made the original brilliant was how all of that was made to work on the screen. Jurassic Park saw Spielberg applying the lessons of what was then a brilliant career. The suspense and the slow build-up of Jaws, the character of E.T., the practical technological wizardry of Close Encounters, to improve on a book that had been written with a clear purpose in mind, a story to tell, a message to impart. Care and craftsmanship went into every facet of Jurassic Park, which pushed the boundaries of animatronics while managing to make what could have been a tawdry spectacle of dinosaurs stomping around impressively, focus instead on brilliantly crafted, instantly recognisable, forever memorable human characters. Jurassic Park understood the value of claustrophobia. It understood the threat of absence, the suspense of a hint of a sound, of the threat of something lurking in the jungle that you cannot see. It understood that our wonder at the time when dinosaurs walked the earth is born of two things, scale and scarcity, the enormity of the creatures and the fact they do not, in fact, walk the earth any longer. It understood that all wonder suffers diminishing returns, overexposure dulls the senses. Consequently, it deployed its CGI sparingly and to maximize effect. The first shot of the Brachiosaurus has the audience wearing much the same expression as Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler and Ian Malcolm. The first panoramic shot, one of only a couple across the entire film, shows us the sheer dumbfounding or inspiring majesty of creation. But from that, the film then draws you in, literally, with its setting and its camera work, to the confines of the jungle, the dark corridors of access tunnels, the isolated control bunker. It forces us in with its principal characters in order that we, like they, come to fear the outside world. So much of what the film attempts to convey comes from the expressions of its cast, the terror they demonstrate, with the dinosaurs glimpsed in some mere aspect much more often than they are seen in the full. The eye of the T-Rex, the clicking claws of the Velociraptors as they hunt the children through the kitchen, the thrill and the scream of the Dilophosaurus. The film in fact had no principal villain. Villains were not the point of Jurassic Park. Its point, being the recreation of the dinosaurs, was the recreation of a form of cold and heartless nature of the type that had to end in order that we could come to be. The enemy, if there was one, was nature itself. One of Spielberg's masterstrokes being the removal of John Hammond's villainous traits, as found in the book, and his supplanting of them with romantic, childlike naivety and optimism. John Hammond is simultaneously the architect of all this destruction, the cause of so much death, and also the most sympathetic character in the entire story because, as Ellie Sattler says, who wasn't taken in by the magic of his ideas? Who didn't want to see Jurassic Park work? I could go on, and on, and on at much greater length about what makes that film so much more than its sales pitch, so much more than its premise, but Jurassic World, by contrast, junked every single aspect of the technique and the thought and the imagination that made Jurassic Park what it was. Gone was the attention to scene construction, the manipulation of fear through claustrophobia, 
Jurassic World gave us green screened panorama after green screened panorama, taking all the wonder of the 10 second shot we saw in its progenitor film and stretching it out for minutes at a time, rendering this wondrous park a cold, sterile and soulless creation. Gone was its conveyance of a serious ethical or philosophical dilemma, replaced by boilerplate messaging about nebulous corporate greed of the type we see in every film funded by nebulous greedy corporations. Gone was its ancestors pitting of man against nature. This film needed a villain and promptly gave us the cliché cynical Dr. Wu and his arms manufacturing backers, whose plan for the Velociraptors remains one of the most utterly fucking ridiculous motivations ever put on screen. These animals can replace thousands of poops on the ground. We have these puppies in Tora Bora. It also decided that the thing to do with its dinosaurs was to genetically imbue them with the same plot-convenient personality algorithm the rest of its human cast had been programmed with, resulting in the perpetually irritating blue and the absurdist Indominus Rex with its dumb fuck cloaking device, unironically lifted from an old Tekken animated movie, which nobody remembers because it was incredibly shit. Oh, that Jurassic World had met the same fate as that. And gone was Jurassic Park's reliance on characters. Where once we had the deep believability and variety of Sadler, Grant and Malcolm, Jurassic World gave us generic macho man, generic frigid corporate bitch, generic horny teenage boy, generic young super autist, generic arms dealing douche, and generic meta nerd, all of whom had as much personality and feeling as John Hammond's rotting left bollock. People lapped it up of course, gone are the days when we might have looked to blockbusters to restore or even maintain our faith in humanity. And fittingly, for a film with a moral message supposedly condemning relentless greed and the need to go bigger and bolder and flashier all the time, Universal Studios decided to be relentlessly greedy and to go bigger, bolder and flashier with two sequels, which at the time of Fallen Kingdom, the previous film in this franchise, were faithfully mapping the original trilogy's descent from gold to brown sludge. Alan. In that film, our generic band of idiot heroes were joined by a few newer, even more generic sidekicks to go rescue a few dinosaurs from an exploding island, only for them to be betrayed in vaguely farcical circumstances by evil goons intent on selling said dinos on the black market, which apparently they hadn't thought to do over any of the many decades that dinosaurs had been wandering around Site B unmolested and unguarded. In the end, and in circumstances too ridiculous to recount in full, our heroes are given a choice. Let the dinos die in toxic gas or press the button and unleash them upon the world. The decision, however, was taken out of their hands by a random young girl who is a clone for some reason and therefore sympathises with the dinos because they are also clones, Jesus fucking Christ that film, and she presses the button and lets them all escape, which brings us up to the present, and also means that anyone at all who dies during the course of Jurassic World Dominion does so because of Clone Girl. Everything that follows is her fault, and I am morally certain she will have litres of blood on her hands by the time this is all over. For myself, the only question I'm even slightly excited about answering here is how, by what mindfuckery, will they make this film worse than the last one? Because I'm sure they will, shite finds a way. But my mind cannot fathom the inner workings of a writer's room at Universal Studios, so I'm sure that however low my expectations are going into this film, they will find a way to surprise me yet again. We open on the set of Extreme Fishing, and a boat being mullered by the Mesosaurus, followed by a montage of news reports showing dinosaurs rampaging all over the world. How are there so many of them, given so few were released at the end of Fallen Kingdom? How were they not immediately captured or put down? Do we not have tanks and an air force? Donald Trump was reportedly willing to nuke a hurricane. I feel like the emergence of big man-eating monsters might have elicited some kind of response from the Pentagon. A voiceover informs us that most of the big predators were captured, but then the film sort of forgets that five seconds later and shows us some pretty big predators indeed just wandering around the world causing havoc. Apparently the dinosaurs spread across borders and a global black market arose, which still doesn't explain how the handful of dinosaurs that escaped the mansion actually got this far, or bred this rapidly, or spread across borders uninterrupted in the first place. We're also told that illegal poaching is a threat to the dinosaurs because well, when you have giant man-eating reptiles wandering around, the thing you're really concerned about is that nobody shoots them unless they have a proper permit. But anyway, if people have been going around shooting dinosaurs willy-nilly, doesn't that make it even less likely that they've managed to spread to this extent? And it was already vanishingly unlikely. The film has taken a premise that strains credulity and actually baked in mechanics that make it less probable than that. 
A generic evil company has been given sole collection rights. Generic evil company is headed by fucking Lewis Dodson. Dodson! Dodson! We've got Dodson here! See, nobody cares. And he's gone from being implied ruthless mercenary to woke corporate overlord, earnestly intoning that dinosaurs can teach us more about ourselves. But how? He was a fucking fixer, a mercenary in the employ of a rival biotech firm for InGen. Well, fuck it, the film doesn't care, we shouldn't, there's plenty more to get onto. Jesus Christ, it gets worse. Inexplicably, random voiceover woman, and so the world as a whole, has heard rumours of a human clone, clone girl, who mysteriously disappeared. Meaning I guess that everyone in universe watched the last film and so everyone is aware of the very secret events that took place in the secluded mansion explicitly engineered to be hush-hush so that nobody cottoned onto the illegal black market auction taking place there. This entire opening monologue is some of the most hackneyed exposition I have ever seen on film, like ever seen on film. Narrator Woman has just given us a point by point summary of the last film, transported us forward to the present day with all the care and grace of a hate fuck from Ted Bundy, and then it closes with the moral dilemma. Now the dinosaurs are back and on the rampage and causing untold death and destruction, do we have a responsibility to care for them, or should we be evil and nasty and mean and kill them all? Oh, oh, and we see fucking pterosaurs nesting on top of skyscrapers. This would not have happened. At the end of the first book, Site A, the original Jurassic Park on Isla Nublar, is basically napalm to prevent this from happening. Because, lo and behold, napalm is quite good at killing dinosaurs. Yes, a few small specimens escape, but the idea you could reach a point where allosaurs are marching through Seattle and pterosaurs are making babies on top of the Chrysler building is unquantifiably silly. Jesus, and that was just the opening monologue. I'm probably going to have to gloss over a few points in this review, otherwise it will end up being about three days long, but we continue nonetheless. We cut to generic reformed corporate bint carrying on the gorilla dino rescuing hobby she developed in the last film and breaking baby dinos out of captivity, which I assume means that she is also partly responsible for the deaths of innocent people by contributing to dino proliferation. There follows a car chase in which our fleeing heroes are saved by some angry triceratops that just happened to be milling conveniently about in a field at night time. I honestly think I'm going to struggle to make it to the end of this film. Once safe, reformed corporate Bint has a conversation with some more oppressively generic sidekicks she's picked up from somewhere, who ask if she's saving dinosaurs because she wants to make things better, or because she wants to forgive herself for… something, I, I don't care. Meanwhile, generic action man is riding horses with some Parasaurolophus in the snow. <laughs> what are you doing? Again, reasons and he fucking lassoes one of them, which he's able to hold, despite it being a huge fucking dinosaur, and then he calms it down using the force. Does this work on all dinosaurs now? It made dangerously little sense when we first saw him use it on Blue, but the idea was that he'd trained that little bitch from birth and semi-domesticated it. Blue responds to signals, responds to its training, so yes, though it was mammothly dumb, it at least worked according to the mechanics the original Jurassic World established. But now? Well, it just works on any massive reptile, apparently. Or does it? Will it work on any of them? I think we can assume it won't work on any dinosaur that poses a threat to them or that the plot needs to be inconvenient for a bit, right? I mean, you couldn't use it on any random, aggressive, evil dinosaur that's threatening them, right? But anyway, Random Parasaurolophus in the tundra that he's never met and just chased on horseback and then lassoed, well, yeah, it works on that. Why not? Don't question it. We're only 10 minutes in, and it's already clear that asking any of the massive questions this film throws at you will fatally undermine the film that is posing those questions to begin with. Meanwhile, Clone Girl is working as a lumberjack. Yep, yeah, that's the thing she's doing. She cycles back to camp where a Diplodocus is just kind of ambling around. Some nice lumberjack on the back of a lorry lights a flare and leads it slowly away, because Diplodocus are fucking moths, apparently. Look, film, I know what you're going for here. This is the thing Doctors Grant and Malcolm do to lead the T-Rex away from the kids in Jurassic Park. But that scene actually works, because it takes care to establish that this monster has a vision based on movement. So of course, if it's hunting for prey, and it sees somebody waving a flare around, it is going to have its attention peaked. It is not supposed to work on every fucking dinosaur, because dinosaurs are not, in fact, moths that are drawn to the nearest bloody flame, actually. 
Also, how did you let it get into the middle of your camp before you decided to lead it away? Wouldn't you have spotted it coming several miles off and diverted it? I wonder if this brand of problem will occur again. I'm going to work hard to praise this film where I can. This shot, though it is all kinds of dumb, at least looks kind of pretty. The music is vaguely sentimental. Anyway, that's enough being nice, let's get back to stupid. Clone Girl is feeling trapped and isolated because she's not allowed to do the thing we just saw her doing. In other words, wandering around freely chopping wood. She has a character moment with reformed corporate bint. Action Man arrives, they have a moment, and Chris Pratt looks like he really cannot believe he's still in this garbage. It is the most unenthused I have ever seen him. Meanwhile, we learn that Blue is still around, and Blue has a baby now. Baby Blue is a thing. It's clumsy and it falls over. How very cute. They stalk a rabbit, the rabbit gets attacked by a wolf, Baby Blue attacks the wolf. It's implied they live very close to Action Man, Clone Girl, and Corporate Bent, who we know live pretty close to a lot of lumberjacks, but I'm going to assume some sort of arrangement has been reached where the Velociraptor agrees not to attack people, because you can make complex societal arrangements with vicious predatory dinosaurs in this universe. Meanwhile, Dr. Sattler is back. She's investigating a plague of giant locusts that just swarmed some children. Meanwhile, Dr. Grant is back. They've coaxed Sam Neill off his vineyard and he has gone back to digging up bones. And again, trying to praise the film where I can, it is nice seeing him reunite with Sattler. She explains she split up from the husband we saw her have in Jurassic Park 3, meaning this film does in fact acknowledge the existence of films beyond the first one, having very deliberately and selectively forgotten about them where the existence of Site B would have broken the already broken plot of Fallen Kingdom. Dr. Sattler fills Grant in on generic evil company's attempts to control the global food supply, reasons again, and ropes him into her investigation. They need to get into a generic evil company facility to take DNA samples from more giant locusts. And how are they going to get in? Well, because Dr. Malcolm is back and he works for them and he told her how. Why would he and Malcolm work for a generic evil company that experiments with genetics and keeps dinosaurs when experimenting with genetics and keeping dinosaurs is the thing he has been consistently opposed to since practically his first fucking scene in Jurassic Park? Why would a generic evil company that keeps dinosaurs and experiments with genetics hire someone who has those views on keeping dinosaurs and experimenting with genetics? Well, maybe we'll find out. Meanwhile, Clone Girl meets Baby Blue and then Big Blue arrives and Clone Girl states that it is impossible that Blue should have become pregnant, which annoys Blue because anyone can be a birthing person these days so long as they believe it hard enough. Action Man has to de-escalate tensions with his force powers again because Blue doesn't, in fact, have a gentleman's agreement not to attack humans, which just reopens the problem mentioned earlier having to do with a lack of dead humans around the Velociraptor. However, an evil man, with whom Action Man has been working, is spying on them, and he sees Clone Girl flounce off after an argument with Action Man. He is here to kidnap her, and he takes his opportunity to ram his car into Blue and knock Blue off a cliff and I have no idea what's going on. They capture Clone Girl on a bridge and Action Man jumps into action, but as he and Corporate Binter are preparing to leave, Blue comes back from the bottom of the cliff and confronts them and I still have no idea what's going on. It turns out Blue is unhappy because Evil Man took Baby Blue as well, but Action Man uses the Force again to explain that he will get Baby Blue back, it's a promise, and Blue, the Velociraptor, just kind of accepts it. Meanwhile, generic sidekick from earlier now works for the CIA because, of course, and next to what I assume is a clone of Dennis Nedry, and this allows Corporate Bin to call in a favor because Generic Sidekick has been tracking a black market in Malta, and they decide Clone Girl will probably be auctioned there. CIA Guy asks them to promise not to go in and mess everything up for him, despite having just given them all the information they need to do just that, and despite there being a lot of plot left to happen, which I'm morally certain will involve them going there, and yes, messing everything up. Doctors Grant and Sattler arrive at Generic Evil Company's facility. It turns out they are building a safe wildlife preserve for captured dinos, and indeed they've managed to turn a valley in the middle of what looks like the Arctic into a tropical rainforest suitable for all these dinosaurs. They have pterosaurs as well, and you might think it might be difficult to keep them because they fly, but it's fine because the valley has protected airspace, and pterosaurs are known to adhere to basic rules and regulations governing air traffic, so they don't leave. It's also explained they keep the rest of the dinosaurs in line with mind control. Sattler and Grant meet Dodgson, who is this film's version of John Hammond. 
Each of these films has a discount Hammond. We had discount Indian Hammond in the first Jurassic World who crashed his helicopter into some pterosaurs. We had John Hammond's never before mentioned best friend and business partner in Fallen Kingdom. And now we have Dodgson, whose character more or less requires A, that you haven't read the books, and B, that you don't actually remember him from Jurassic Park. At what point in the intervening years did the ruthless cynical mercenary trying to steal trade secrets from InGen become an environmentally conscious conservationist with his own biotech company with enough money to turn Arctic valleys into tropical reservations with mind-controlled dinosaurs? Now, you might have noticed, I am not doing too many of my usual asides teasing out too much of this plot, asking too many questions, delving into too much lore, exploring possible or apparent contradictions, and there is a reason for that, which is... I, I physically can't. Exploring each nonsensical instance in this plot would produce a script longer than the fucking Cretaceous era. There is so much that's just plain ridiculous about this film that it defies explanation. Which means the only thing to do really is just to lay it out, and happily it is so obviously dumb as hell that you, dear viewer, probably don't really need me to explain the what and the why of it anyway. Some things need only to be underlined. Were I proofreading this script, the entire fucking thing would be underlined. Meanwhile, Dr. Malcolm is giving another speech about man being subordinate to nature, telling a room full of students at generic evil company's inexplicable on-site campus that they are fucking with the world again. He draws an analogy with nuclear power, saying that genetic power was created with no idea how it works or what it was capable of, but that, like nuclear power, we just pressed the button and hoped for the best. Which is categorically not what we did with nuclear power at all. This is ethical contrarianism, not ethical positioning. Malcolm's position in Jurassic Park actually has the benefit of Michael Crichton's close reading of the relevant science and his belief in complexity theory, or rather, the unviability of human attempts to control complex systems. He gave whole speeches on the subject while he was alive that are well worth watching on the YouTubes. But the analogy with genetics is not nuclear power. Crichton actually busted a lot of the alarmist myths Ian Malcolm is here peddling about that, but with environmental science, which was one of Crichton's biggest bugbears in his final years. Doubtless for reasons of politics, Crichton's self-insert character cannot be allowed to continue espousing beliefs Crichton actually held about the specific things he criticised. The belief that we can understand systems as complex as the global climate, never mind predict it, never mind control it, because to do so would contradict one of the abiding political fashions of our time. So instead the writers have here drawn wholly inaccurate parallels with nuclear power that, paradoxically and predictably, means in effect that they are propagandizing against one of the few things guaranteed to actually better the environment, in the name of sparing the blushes of people who say they want to protect the environment. Top work! Glad to see so much thought going into the message behind this film. Malcolm closes by saying that achieving revolutionary change means we must transform human consciousness. Whatever the fuck that means, and no, it absolutely doesn't by the logic of every position he has ever held. You can't control a dinosaur genome, you sure as hell cannot alter human consciousness with predictable results, you dolt. But hey, the old gang is now back together. And bear with me here, Malcolm uses the noise of a coffee machine as cover to tell Sattler that generic evil company is in fact generically evil, no matter how friendly it looks on the surface. Because it has the technology to control the minds of dinosaurs, but its CCTV cameras and microphones cannot filter out the noise of a fucking espresso machine. Meanwhile, it turns out Dodgson is still a generically evil man after all, and he now has Henry Wu working for him. Their genetically engineered locusts are going to create a global famine, Wu explains, and this is a bad thing because he's decided he's a good man again or at least morally ambiguous, having been an amoral jerk for the past two films. There are strong X-Files vibes here, and not particularly good X-Files either. The bang average film where Mulder and Scully investigate genetically engineered bees and discover a conspiracy. Swap bees for locusts, and you have this entire subplot. Meanwhile, Clone Girl is handed over to generic evil woman alongside Baby Blue, and we are also introduced to diverse female Han Solo, who clearly has doubts regarding the morality of smuggling clone girls and dinosaurs, and who will absolutely reappear as a goodie later. Action Man and ex-corporate Bint have arrived in Malta to mess everything up for the CIA. I still can't believe this is a thing that's happening, and they go for a stroll through the underground market, which is full of dinosaurs and evil people doing evil things to dinosaurs. We also run into diverse female Han Solo again, as a fat man tries to negotiate passage to Alderaan while avoiding any Imperial entanglements. 
and it turns out that she knows ex-corporate Bint, which is very, very lucky because it means they can help each other out via V rescuing Clone Girl. Are you keeping up? Because um, I wouldn't blame you if you weren't. We also meet back up with one of Action Man's sidekicks from the original Jurassic World. I assume he now also works for the CIA. Now, remember the monumentally shitty idea these films have been pushing, despite it being one of the most absurd suggestions ever committed to page by sentient people, using laser-guided dinosaurs as weapons of war? Well, they are still pushing it. These writers really love their laser-guided dinosaurs, and Generic Evil Woman is now trying to smuggle some laser-guided velociraptors out of Malta using Generic Bad Guy from earlier, all under the watchful eye of Action Man who is spying on them. Apparently the Saudi Arabians want them because… Uh, well, I mean, one of the many advantages of deploying something as nonsensical as laser-guided dinosaurs as a plot device is that it sort of makes every other consideration pale by comparison. So it's almost not worth trying to imagine what Mohammed bin Salman could possibly want laser-guided velociraptors for, or to try and imagine what use they'd be deployed on the front lines in Yemen, or in the tunnels of Lebanon, or on the Iranian border. But it does pose a question with potentially amusing permutations for an answer. If the Saudis have entered the game with laser-guided velociraptors, how would the Iranians up their game? Would they deploy a contingent of heat-seeking allosaurs to Hezbollah, maybe? Do the Israelis now have to fear satellite-guided pterodactyls launched from Tehran? Anyway, suddenly the CIA. So it looks like the Americans might have thrown a spanner in the dino arms trade, which they absolutely have an interest in doing, because we can't have a domestic arms manufacturer undercut by a glut of enhanced prehistoric killing machines. A Velociraptor is definitely better than an M1 Abrams. I'm sure Lockheed Martin wouldn't want to see its F-35 program threatened by weaponized, fish-eating fucking pterosaurs. Action Man then chases Generic Evil Guy through the underground market, and Generic Evil Guy accidentally frees what I assume are a couple of allosaurs, which hold off eating Action Man because he uses the force on both of them at once, and this is… this is actually happening. I am not drunk. I am not high. I am now watching Action Man and Generic Evil Guy face off in a dinosaur cockfighting ring while random allosaurs tear apart the backdrop. I am now watching baby dinosaurs eat random evil man's arms while Action Man interrogates him. I am now watching Generic Evil Woman command that they release laser-guided velociraptors and uses a laser pointer to direct them against the CIA like they're massive fucking murder cats. I am now watching Reformed Corporate Bent fighting evil Generic Woman in a random Maltese apartment using an anti-dinosaur taser only for Generic Evil Woman to use her laser pointer to direct another Velocipussy to chase Corporate Bent across Maltese rooftops like a scene from James Bond but with fucking dinosaurs, and I don't say this lightly but this might just be the most ridiculous film I have ever seen. And I've seen The Matrix Resurrections. Amid all this spectacular, unfathomable nonsense, Clone Girl is being dumped on a plane and taken to Generic Evil Company. Action Man's force powers also work on laser-guided dinosaurs, and he uses it to trick one of them back inside its cage, while Corporate Bint and diverse female Han Solo escape yet more laser-guided Velocipussies, while Action Man rides a motorbike through the streets of Malta being chased by more laser-guided dino cunts, and it actually looks worse than the trailer, which is really saying something because the trailer looked incredibly fucking bad. Words, words are failing me, it is impossible to seriously critique this film. There are fucking allosaurs or some shitosaurs in the middle of a Maltese plaza casually eating diners who just didn't notice them until it was too late. There's a motorbike chase, there is a plane chase. My usual approach to these videos is to script as I watch and pause whenever something especially bad happens that needs explaining that this film has beaten me. I cannot do that. It is impossible. I could write infinite words on this film and not manage to convey the sheer mindfuckery of what it is doing. I am trying everything. I am trying to put myself in the minds of the writers as they came up with this script, for example. And the only thing I can conclude is that someone took all the cocaine in San Francisco and mixed it with all the LSD in Manhattan and sat down with a one-word brief reading dinosaurs and wrote their stream of consciousness for the next three hours and submitted it. And then some studio exec who had taken all the crystal meth in Chicago and mixed it with all the MDMA in Seattle drew the most surreal fucking tick ever devised by the human mind and thus this film was greenlit, and thus it came to be. I have never had this range of emotions watching a film. 
I have never had this acute blend of hilarity mixed with rage and shock and awe and nonchalant carefree what the fuckery. And I'm fucking sober. My god, this film. This makes Sharknado look like a sincere attempt at an Academy Award. Corporate Bint opens the rear door of the moving aeroplane so Action Man can drive his motorbike on board just before the plane flies over a cliff and then he knocks the motorbike back after him to yeet a raptor that jumped on the plane after him and they're, they're free now. We can breathe again, let's all just calm down, let's chill out, let's relax and let's take in... Actually, no, let's not even try to take it in. Let's bury it like the deepest, severest trauma and just agree never to think of it again. Meanwhile, Dr. Sattler and Grant are still being given a tour around Generic Evil Company's dino breeding facility because what they're really doing here is just rebuilding Jurassic Park. The tour must have taken the better part of a day though because Clone Girl has been flown all the way from Malta in the intervening period and is now with Dr. Wu. I'm not sure how long it takes to actually fly from Malta to the Arctic Circle. I don't think the film knows, I don't think it cares, and given the sheer amount of fuckery that is this script, I am not going to critique teleportation when there is so much else that is so much more absurd that I have yet to describe. Wu shows her the woman she was cloned from. Apparently she was brilliant. Much more brilliant and morally brilliant and morally perfect and pure than Wu himself. We learn that Mrs. Django Fett then discovered that she had a rare genetic disorder, and we're explicitly told she didn't know about it until after Clone Girl was born. Except that when she asks Wu whether she has the rare genetic condition too, what with her being a clone and all, Wu explains that Mrs. Jango Fett altered every cell in Clone Girl's body to eradicate the disease that she didn't know she had until after Clone Girl was born, as Wu just finished telling us about three seconds ago. Well, fuck it. It turns out that Wu wants to study Clone Girl so he can fix the world and put right the mistake he made in genetically engineering giant locusts to cause a global famine. Remember that? Remember that's a thing? I am usually quite good at this if I do say so myself and I am really, really struggling to keep up. I don't think it's the lingering effects of the coronavirus I have. I think it is just this film makes no fucking sense. Somehow, Sattler and Grant have donned disguises and gone sneaking around generic evil facility in what is, again, almost a shot-by-shot -shot take from that oppressively average X-Files film. All we need is Sattler to get stung by a locust. Meanwhile, Dodgson rightly points out that Wu probably shouldn't be showing Clone Girl all this classified information on his computer, making him the only character in this entire film who has ever had something even faintly resembling the right idea. But then, the Raptor escapes, and so he sets off an alarm that frees the locusts for absolutely no fucking reason whatsoever, meaning Grant and Sattler have to run away from the swarm again, just like the X-Files. Clone Girl uses this as cover to escape, and during her escape she bumps into Sattler and Grant, who have just been fumigated while not wearing masks but are showing no ill effects whatsoever, and they all run away. Meanwhile, diverse female Han Solo and Action Man and Corporate Bint are flying toward the generic evil facility, where Dodgson is wandering around as though a Velociraptor has not just escaped and forced him to inexplicably free his giant locusts. Honestly, just... But generic evil facility denies them permission to land. But they keep coming, so... So bear with me here. So Dodgson turns off air traffic control, and that means the plane can get attacked by mountainous pterosaurs. And here's a thing. I'd kind of expected I might have time to ask questions during this review. Questions like, do the dinosaurs depicted actually live where they are shown living? Did these pterosaurs actually live in mountains? Could they have lived in mountains, given their massive size and the unreliability of the updrafts they would have used for flight that could more reliably have been found over oceans, where many fish-eating species in fact lived? If they did live in the mountains, would they realistically have attacked something as big as an aeroplane? And if they would have attacked something as big as an aeroplane, could they realistically have managed to puncture its metal hole with their beaks and talons? But then, as I am poised to ask these questions, 
I realize I'm watching pterosaurs governed by air traffic control, attacking an aeroplane over an evil facility that mind controls dinosaurs and creates giant locusts and tries to cure cancer by kidnapping clone girls. And when that is the level of the plot, it just seems futile asking simple mechanical questions like, can birds beat planes? The plane has no parachutes and only one ejector seat, so Action Man bravely volunteers corporate bent to take the ejector seat, where she promptly and predictably is mobbed by the fucking pterosaurs that just bought down the aeroplane with much more armor plating than she has. But she survives anyway and crashes into a forest, while the plane crash lands into water above a dam, protecting the tropical arctic forest. Meanwhile, back in generic evil facility, Statler and Waldorf, I mean Statler and Grant, are discovered by the tour guide who's been showing them around until this point, so you might think they are fucked. But then, because what this film really needs is a plot twist, given how tediously logical and sane and easy it has thus far been to follow, it turns out our tour guide is a mole and he's on their side after all, so he helps them escape and… Uh, well, fuck it, there's no time to ask questions. Meanwhile, Corporate Bint has crash landed in the tropical arctic forest and she tries to escape but then she is accosted by the franchise's first semi-feathered dinosaur, which looks, like, menacing enough, I guess? Though having gone with featherless dinos thus far, it should probably have continued with this aesthetic. Big Bird looks pretty firmly herbivorous at having a beak and no obvious teeth, but it follows her anyway as she crawls into some water and ducks for cover, and then it gets bored and wanders off, meaning this entire sequence was literally just there for the sake of the trailer. Meanwhile, Action Man and diverse female Han Solo survive their plane crash back up in the Arctic, but the ice they're standing on begins to crack because, well, why not? We're trying everything else. Why not waste time building tension with a walking on the ice sequence to distract from the fact this film does not have a fucking story? Another feathered dinosaur shows up, and this is now becoming a little bit irritating because there's absolutely no reason to selectively retcon a franchise long inaccuracy while you're paying so little heed to accuracy the rest of the time. This new dinosaur goes into the water beneath the ice, Action Man falls into the ice, diverse female Han Solo pulls him out of the ice, dinosaur jumps out of the ice, they run away from the dinosaur on the ice, and the ice is no longer at risk of cracking, the dinosaur chases them across the dam into an elevator where diverse female Han Solo tases the dinosaur in the face, and the elevator descends. I'm, I'm struggling. Guys, I'm really struggling. I feel like trying to review this film has done lasting damage to my integrity. Mean fucking while, a generic goon only now tells Dodgson that a camera saw Ian Malcolm putting an access key in Dr. Sattler's pocket, which is the kind of thing you ought probably to have mentioned before now, mate, to be honest. And on the cam copy, a woman walks out of the theatre presumably in disgust. Dodgson shuts down the shuttle thing Dr. Sattler and Dr. Grant and Clone Girl are using to escape, and they disembark in a random cave because... What you really want on your shuttlecraft is for the doors to still be operable after you've shut it down, and for random caves it stops in to be perfectly accessible. He summons Dr. Malcolm for a dressing down, knowing that Malcolm is basically responsible for this entire mess. But then he just sort of invites him to leave, only for Malcolm to cause a distraction by giving another speech about the impending extinction of our species. Dodgson tells him he thought he might be different. But what in the shuddering fuck would lead him to suspect that? This is Ian fucking Malcolm. This is literally his whole thing. You employed him to give lectures to your undergraduates, who you randomly have on this secure facility, shitting on your entire project. How is anything Malcolm says or does here a surprise? More's the point, why the fuck did you hire him to begin with? And in response, Dodgen fires him. And that's it. He just, he just fires him and asks him to leave. Why are you doing this? Why is he here? Why are you letting him go? Meanwhile, in a Jurassic Park 3 reference, we are doing that now. Action Man and diverse female Han Solo discover a corporate Bint's parachute, but they are interrupted by a T-Rex, which is interrupted by a Giganotosaurus, much like the Spinosaurus, but instead of killing the T-Rex, the Rex just backs down and walks away, I don't even know. Meanwhile, in the mines, Sattler and Grant and Clone Girl have a moment where they talk about kids. Meanwhile, Malcolm has been rescued by the same rando who rescued Sattler, Grant, and Clone Girl, and now they are sneaking around the facility without anybody noticing them. Malcolm gets in a car and drives off to the mines to rescue Sattler, Grant, and Clone Girl, who are surprised by some spiny carnivorous cave dwelling fuckface, predictably so. We get another chase, but they get stuck behind some railings. But then Malcolm turns up at precisely the right moment 
and he cracks jokes as they face near certain death, and he tries to guess the four digit code to the gate, only for tour guide to input the code remotely. So they're all safe now while we go off for bloody corporate bint to face almost exactly the same dilemma, or dilofa, get it, with some Dilophosaurus. Remember how I said I was trying hard to praise this film? Well, the Dilophosaurus make the noises they make in the first film, that's, that's a nice touch. One of them does its frilly thing in her face, only for Action Man and Han Solo to turn up, and Action Man choke slams the Dilophosaurus, which is totally a thing you can do now, and then it runs away. Meanwhile, Dodgson goes and burns all of his giant locusts only for them to escape, and burst out of the roof of the facility, so now there is a burning cloud of giant locusts flying over the dinosaurs, sending mini fireballs down onto them in the tropical arctic forest, because remember the asteroids that wiped out the dinosaur? I don't think a film has ever, ever made me think the human race deserves this treatment as much as this film has, I, I just give up. Malcolm, Grant, Sattler and Clone Girl fall off a small cliff in their car for reasons, but they are rescued by Action Man, Corporate Bint and Diverse Female Han Solo, so everyone's together now. Yay. But then, big footsteps. Remember the T-Rex? Well, fuck the T-Rex, remember the Giganotosaurus? The Giganotosaurus? Racist! Well, fuck the T-Rex, remember the... is it Giganotosaurus? Giganotosaurus, Giganotosaurus. Well, that shows up, prompting both Grant and Action Man to say, Don't, don't move. Hey, like the flare thing from all that time ago, it works on one specific dinosaur, so it's logical to assume it works on every single dinosaur. Just like waving at a duckbill platypus is functionally the same and will reap the same rewards as waving at a tiger. Because animals, they're all the same, right? The Giganotosaurus eats a flaming locust, and they decide it's fine to move for a bit after all, because they take a jog around the upturned car to hide from it, despite it being mere feet away from them, because remember hiding behind the car? It stalks them around the car, and they quite blatantly continue to run away from it, therefore moving, and violating the don't move order, and it doesn't seem all that fussed by them, so they start climbing a ladder, and then it almost eats Clone Girl, but then, remember the flare? Well, Ian Malcolm, who didn't run with them to the ladder, picks up a burning plank of wood, and he waves the plank of wood, and he distracts the Jaganotosaurus, then throws it like a fucking javelin into the Jaganotosaurus's fucking mouth, and he runs away. This is a thing that did happen. Never in the field of human writing has so much been fucked for so many by so few. And then... I'm really struggling to keep up with this. And then they all climb into something, and the Giganotosaurus attacks them again, only for diverse female Han Solo to calmly walk to the back of the room, pick up the world's biggest dart gun, remember the dart gun, and shoot it, and then Corporate Bint tases it in the face, and it runs away. Meanwhile, the entire forest is now burning because of the locusts. Don't ask, just go with it. And Dodgen gets mildly angry and orders an evacuation which involves using the mind control device to direct the dinosaurs into a fucking bomb shelter. What exactly do they expect to happen once the Giganotosaurus is in a confined space with a lovely little Diplodocus? The next plot madness involves them having to go and find a way to turn on the air traffic control system that tells the pterodactyls not to attack helicopters. Dodgson tries to convince the tour guide that they can rebuild and offers him a promotion, but the tour guide says nah, and Dodgson realises he's been set up. Meanwhile, my god, just let it be fucking over already. Our ragtag group of heroes try to reactivate air traffic control, but our tour guide has magically appeared to inform them that they can't turn it on because there isn't enough power, so they have to escape through some tunnels to find the thing to turn it on, which leaves them just enough time, apparently, for Action Man to find Baby Blue, which he has to do because he made a promise to Blue. How, in a whole burning valley, in a whole collapsing facility, does he propose to find one baby raptor? Why, given the logical conclusion of this film, is that coexistence is impossible, is he bothering at all? What makes him assume a fucking velociraptor understands the concept of promises? Don't care. Meanwhile, they're sneaking through some underground vents on the lookout for raptors, because remember that... Uh, while Sattler and Corporate Bint tried to reactivate the power, because remember... 
Malcolm and Tour Guide guide them over the radios because remember that, yeah, yeah, you remember, it was, it was so much better than this. They flick a switch and all the power goes off, including to the train Dodgson is trying to escape on. Baby Blue attacks them, so they've found her already, but Clone Girl uses the force on the fucking thing, and Alan Grant uses the force on the fucking thing because everyone can use the force now, thanks Ryan Johnson, and it works until it doesn't and then Baby Blue charges but Action Man tranquilizes it, meanwhile Sattler and Corporate Bint get attacked by locusts, meanwhile the power system is on the blink, meanwhile Dodgson has left his train and gone for a stroll down a menacing tunnel where he gets attacked by a convenient Dilophosaurus, so he crawls back into his train, but then it smashes in through a side window, because remember, and they all spit on him, because there are multiple of them now, and he dies, because remember the fuck off. Meanwhile, diverse female Han Solo finds a helicopter, and our heroes go to join her, but then Henry Wu randomly appears, and he explains he can fix the locusts problem if they give him clone girl, because she's magic and clone girl volunteers herself, so they all run to the helicopter, where they see a mind-controlled Brachiosaurus heading for a bomb shelter, and then a T-Rex turns up, and then the Giganotosaurus turns up, and this time they decide they will have a fight because they have to, that's, that's the meme now, and the Giganotosaurus wins, but then it gets attacked by Big Bird, and they have a fight, and then this gives everyone time to get to the chopper, and then the Rex wakes up, and it throws the Giganotosaurus onto the talons of Big Bird, because th this film could only aspire to the level of Godzilla and Mothra against Monster of the Week, and actually, no, the famously nonsensical Godzilla Monsterverse films are actually so much better written than this, and they're awfully written, and then the Giganotosaurus dies, and the audience feels nothing, and the Tyrannosaurus and Big Bird roar together, and, and we still feel nothing. Doctors Sattler and Grant kiss, uh, bringing an ignominious end to the shipping community nobody knew they wanted, and everybody gets on another helicopter and leaves, while we are treated to shots of surviving dinosaurs, then a cutaway to a Senate hearing in which all of our main cast will appear, presumably to find out what the fuck just happened to this film and who was responsible for it. Henry Wu fixes the giant locust problem and gives the credit to deceased Mrs. Django Fett, while another voiceover explains the United Nations has decided generic evil company's tropical Arctic Valley is now a designated dinosaur zone, where they can all live free from the outside world, and that worked so well the last several times they did it. I distinctly remember voiceover woman at the beginning explaining that there was a thriving black market. I distinctly remember that the premise for Fallen Kingdom is that black market thugs invade the last dinosaur refuge and start stealing dinosaurs from it, but hey, consequences? What consequences? We can't expect this film to have a mind to consequences. It says everything is fine, so I guess it must be fine. An Action Man gives Baby Blue back to Blue, and Blue and Action Man share a moment of understanding just fuck off film. And then the dinos run off together. We close with Mrs. Django Fett giving a moral lesson on the need for coexistence over shots of Parasaurolophus running with zebra and Triceratops walking with elephants. You know, exactly like you see happen in the real life African wilderness. The end. The fucking end. I mean, I just, I'm, uh, I, no, I, I just don't, I mean, so I think it might be wise to begin with why, and also what, and I think I'll order a double of who, what, when, and where to go with that, please, with a side of how, and to drink, I'll take an Oreo flavour, just what the fuck was that, I cannot, I cannot critique this film, critique kind of rests on a shared set of assumptions, Basic rules and values, a common language, a fundamental and unquestioned acceptance of certain rules that define one art form as distinct from another. To critique Jurassic World Dominion as a film, it would have to be a film to begin with, and it isn't. I mean, it is not a film in any sense that I recognise. Yep, sure, it has actors in it, it involves cameras, it is played on screens, but the same can be said of porn where in fact much less bloody violating and much more decency and respect for plot and character is to be found than we see from Jurassic World Dominion. This is, if anything, the apogee of postmodern art, born of that school that says structure and intelligibility is the enemy, and things are to be judged as good according to the extent to which they make absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. It is pointless to compare this with earlier offerings, because it simply does not aspire to the same artistic medium, 
it's as futile to compare Jurassic World Dominion to Jurassic Park as it would be to compare vaginal warts to the concept of Norway. It has no mind for filmic technique, scene construction, plot progression, character development, stakes, meaning, message, morals, purpose, or payoff. If this is to be considered a film, then it has to go down as one of the worst attempts at film ever devised. It is staggeringly bad. I am not joking when I say Sharknado is an objectively better written film. I am not joking when I say The Matrix fucking Resurrections is better, and I thought that was possibly the worst film I'd seen. I cannot recall a more nonsensical approach to story, a more absent plot, a more hectic and ridiculous conveyor belt of action sequences for the sake of action sequences that nevertheless fail to accord with the logic of previous action sequences. This is a film without value, without need, without a sense of what it's supposed to be about, without anything to say. It is either pure desperation, pure cynicism, or perhaps both. It's what happens when some blood-sucking studio demands a trilogy be spun out of material that wouldn't amount to a five-minute web-exclusive episode of a fan-made spin-off. Jurassic World Dominion supposedly forms the culmination of many arcs, that of its new cast, about whom we know little and care less, of the original cast, reduced here to corpses strung up by some cash-strapped puppeteer and devoid of all the life that once animated them, and of the entire Jurassic saga, which began as a bright light in the sky and has here descended as a burning lump of space rock plummeting to Earth and extinguishing all before it. I'm laughing at the film, still, just about, but I don't really have a choice. There is only one alternative to laughter, a deep, sure and terrible realisation that our civilization might be completely and utterly finished as a creative force in the cosmos. Jurassic World Dominion is supposed to impart lessons about the continuation of life through coexistence, but it leaves one asking, what is the fucking point when I don't even want to exist as part of whatever species made this film? Like the dinosaurs it depicts, the Jurassic World trilogy has tried to bring back something that died a very long old time ago indeed, and its parodic mimic of life only proves that extinction was for the best and should have been the end. What a fucking travesty.